Hi, and welcome to Education Roundtable. Uh, my name is Larry Petricaro, and I have with me three guests this evening. Uh, Jamil Misbahuddin, who is the uh, STEM supervisor for grades 9 through 12. Mm -hmm. Kim Bean, who is the uh, in charge of supervisor for math and science for K through 8, I believe. And uh, Ann Bodner, who is the director of curriculum. And uh, they have been in the district a while. I guess, Jamil, you may be relatively new to the district. But Ann was telling me the other day that uh, she actually came through the whole whole system. <laughs> Clinton School to, uh, was it Clinton? Not no, Clinton? I, I was actually at Fielding School, which is the board office. Oh, that's a long that's time ago. That's where I really, yes. I'm an old one. That. I'm, I, I apologize <laughs> to begin with. Um, so we're going to talk tonight about uh, STEM education, some of the um, issues involving STEM, what it means, um, also how access and equity fit into that, and how parents can perhaps help their children and yet, you know, perhaps not a, not a developed psychoses for themselves or for their kids. <laughs> you know, not everybody will be Albert Einstein, but, uh, you know, we're going to work at that. So I think that would be the first question I would like to ask is, you know, I think probably most of us have an idea what, what STEM is. I mean, I have a preconception of what it is, but that doesn't mean I'm right. So since you guys are kind of involved in the trenches, why don't you uh, give me a definition of what it is so we can at least all start on the same page. Sure. So. STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, specifically at the high school, you know, we have a large math department, we have a large science department, but we also have a TV department, business, business teachers, and engineering teachers. And then we also have within math and science, it's not all just, you know, your traditional algebra classes or biology classes. We'll have extensions that kind of blend the subjects, and um, that's really kind of how it looks at, at the high school. Okay. And when does STEM start? When, when do we start paying particular attention to those science, technology, engineering, and math courses? At what point in the um, progression of a student through the uh, school system do we begin to try to maybe focus a little on that? I'm going to say sixth grade. Sixth. Yeah, um, only because the math portion at that piece becomes, um, you know, that's when students can start selecting different courses in mathematics. In science, they don't select math courses really until the high school. But with math they start in sixth grade so what are what are you said there's plenty of courses um, I, I didn't even realize that there were um, opportunities to choose in the uh, elementary or in the middle school uh, uh, curriculum so what are some of the courses mm -hmm. at the high school I mean I, I think when we, we probably tend to think of uh, high school when we get to science so let's if you can, Jamil, perhaps give us a little idea of what's available at Columbia and then I'd like to know what, what kind of things you're talking about at the middle school Sure. So um, outside of your typical math and science classes, we'll have coding classes for, for our math students that want to, you know, get more into, like, game design or applications. Um, within science, we have electives in forensic science, anatomy, astronomy, um, f extensions on physics, environmental science. We also have a science research program that students who just, if they have an interest in research, they'll do this in addition to their required classes where they'll pick a topic and then research it and have a mentor over a few years ultimately with the goal of publishing a paper or, you know, getting their data published uh, by the time they graduate. And then outside of that, we have our TV classes. Our business department has classes in accounting, business management, entrepreneurship. Um, and then in engineering, we have an engineering course, computer-aided design, and also a, an architecture class. And in the middle school, do we, what kind of a choice? Well, we don't, do we certainly have? don't have a selection right. like that. <laughs> um, much more, the courses are much more prescribed. So the students do get some selection in math about which course they're going to take in which year. And then we also have an elective, which is a computer design course, which is a semester long that they can take. And a lot of the aspects that Jamil was talking about, about the engineering, those are worked in through our, when we teach science. So all of those, you have to solve a real world problem using design principles. That's part of the science curriculum in the middle school. Okay, and, and the, um, you, you mentioned a research, uh, like individual research, science research that kids can do. What are some of the topics that, that, that some of the kids in the high school have picked? And, and do they do this for the whole four years? All right, so um, you sign up at the end of freshman year, so you do it sophomore, junior, and senior mm -hmm, year. Mm -hmm. Sophomore year, we just get their feet wet, get them experienced with reading a research paper, understanding how it's laid out. Um, then they start to develop a passion where they'll say, okay, I really want to go further with this idea. And then junior year is when they start actually researching on their own. We usually try to match them up with a mentor, someone like a professor in that field who they can kind of bounce ideas off of and, and work with. 
Um, an example I'm thinking of is uh, we had a student who was really into computer programming and really into um, the outer space and the universe. So he was working on program abilities to map the universe outside of what we already know. And so he was working, yeah, a pretty, really bright student, um, <laughs> really impressive stuff. And so he was working with a professor, I believe it was NYU or some school in the city, and he, they would email and exchange a lot of information, and then he would kind of coalesce all that, and ultimately he's working on presenting his, his final paper this year. Well, you said he's working with someone from NYU, yeah. so, so when the uh, students are working with a uh, mentor, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily somebody at Columbia or somebody in, in the mm -hmm. school system here. Right, it's usually, it's usually someone like in the field right now, so whether it's, and then they'll exchange, usually through email, some students will do internships over the summer, and just get their research time in with that person, yeah. Is that um, something that's relatively new? Has this been going on for a while? Is it, is it something that's common in other high schools? I mean, it strikes me as a pretty impressive uh, program. Right, I think it's relatively new. It, it predates me, so it's maybe at least five or six years it's been going on at Columbia High School. I haven't heard of it in too many other schools. It's an, it's an additional class, so students take you know, physics and chemistry, they're sophomore and junior years, but also take this as an additional class. So it's a small group of students, but anyone that's interested and has a passion for it, they, they really enjoy it. Yeah, that's, uh, and, and you do have um, a telescope at the high school, don't mm -hmm. you? Is that tied in somehow with, uh, with the STEM uh, subjects or? It is, it is with our astronomy class and our astronomy club. Yeah, they'll use those. Um, I don't think the research class is used as much unless your research specifically ties to that, that idea, but mostly it's used for the astronomy students. Okay. And, now, and our, actually, our hope is with the telescope, is, as time goes on, that we'll, we'll be able to um, work with our elementary schools and our middle schools also. We have the capability right now to be able to, through computer and technology, for uh, our elementary and middle schools to see what our telescope is, is seeing at night. So it, it's, it's a work in progress. We will be expanding it as time goes on, but it's all refurbished right now and beautiful and, and ready to go. We, we're, we're, wow. we're planning it out. You know, I've known about that for uh, quite some time, and I've always kind of wanted to see it, but never, never have had that mm -hmm. opportunity. Is it something that uh, the Astronomy Club, do they maintain it? You, you were mentioning the Astronomy Club before. So they use the space. We actually only just recently renovated mm -hmm. it this summer. Mm -hmm. Before they had the, like, a, a, like a physical telescope they had on a tripod that they were using in that space. But now the actual telescope that we've had for some time is, is functional and ready to be used. Now the, the, the um, curriculum portion, of I mean, curriculum is always something that, uh, that, that, that I'm not sure I quite understand it, what, what it means. but. Everything that we've been talking about is is a part of the curriculum. Or is there certain like aspects of it, or is this a like, super curriculum? Uh, the, 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 some of the STEM subjects. They, it all applies toward graduation, I guess. Every, right? Well, yes. Every every class that we teach, no matter what um, grade level it is, each class and subject has a curriculum that goes that is presented to the students. Um, teachers use it to teach their lessons and organize and all of our curricula is um, connected to state standards mm -hmm. that the state gives us and we, we follow. Um, so for instance, and we are constantly updating it and revising it all year long, every year for, for the most part. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's, it's a lot of work, but we want to keep current. And I think that's one of the things with, with STEM, especially it's constantly changing and technology is constantly changing. And we're learning more about best practices and things to do that we want to keep uh, working on our curriculum. I mean, right now we have, I think, for since the summer until June, we have about 85 curricula being updated and revised um, and we're in the process of doing that. and then next year we'll have a second half of probably about the same number being updated and revised and one of those things I know that we really have a plan for is astronomy looking at it now that the everything's working beautifully with the new, with the telescope um, we need to we need to expand it a bit more and then also Kim and Jamil will be able to work together to um, really so that it at the elementary level, Kim can work on a curriculum that can that can use the astronomy at uh, access at uh, the high school. So it's you know we're constantly updating, constantly um, making things more current and relevant to what we learn and what our students are doing. And as we we're revising things, we're maybe not exactly focusing completely on STEM, but mm -hmm. certainly trying to integrate that into the curriculum as it changes. Because uh, I, I would presume if you're if you're in the middle school. Um, that the students in the middle school must, you, you have to, they must 
at some point exhibit that kind of either interest or um, talent and and you know you can, I, I assume you can want to continue to uh, foster that and, and not you know not have them run up against a dead end right I'm really glad you asked that. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I am, because it's um, <clears throat> one of the things that's great about science in particular in the elementary school is everyone loves it. Mm -hmm. And so there is no difference in uh, every single student gets excited for science instruction because it's it's explaining their world and they get to do something that's more much more hands-on and experiential and so they love it and then when they come to the middle school science becomes um, like a full-time subject you know in, in elementary school it's every other day roughly mm -hmm. then when you go into middle school it becomes an everyday subject like math and language arts and and now you're in a lab setting and so we it, it all steps up to a different level and they all are very interested in it so I find that interest is is universal that idea of whether they're, you know, talent, I think was the word you just yeah. used. Um, that, I, I don't see that as a divider um, among students in any way. It's, it's really about how ready they are for a, a different um, course and responsibilities. As long as you do what the teacher is asking you to do, you know, uh, you know her, hand your homework in in time, study for the test, you're going to do well up through, certainly up through eighth grade, Jamil can mm -hmm. talk about it more at the high school, what that distinction is. But I feel like readiness is a bigger distinction about who's ready to take on the responsibilities of being an excellent student. And in mathematics, the readiness in terms of who has the background knowledge in order to be ready for the course that they're in. That's the divider. It's, it's not um, it's not gender, it's not ethnicity, it's not, it's not any of those things. It's really, do they have the background and the, and the readiness to, to take on the course? Well, thank you for that correction. I could, maybe talent was Wasn't the wrong a word. Well, no, but you know, I don't, I, <laughs> you know, I don't want it to sound like I meant that, you know, some kids should be pushed in this direction, some kids should be pushed in another direction. You, you're, sounds like what you're trying to do is let, let the individual students make that determination. And mm -hmm. the way you're making that determination isn't so much in their, uh, um, I don't know what the right word would be, but isn't so much in what they know, but how ready they are to know, to learn, to, to, to keep and moving in the direction. And how interested they are to work on it yeah. extra time. Or I, I would think things. interest must yeah. be a mm -hmm. pretty significant <laughs> thing. The, um, the, the way kids are allowed into the STEM program, or into these things like this, the special mm -hmm. science, or mm -hmm. into the different levels, and I want to talk about that, we'll probably do that after the break, but... Um, Anybody can get into it, or uh, there's no like test, is there? Or? No, there's no there's no test. As long as you've completed the course beforehand, you're el eligible to take any course that's, that follows at any level. Um, and kind of piggybacking off of what Kim said, a big thing that when we speak to students, when we speak to parents, we ask what what your passions are because that's gonna that's gonna drive you through. Because you know it's great to take many honors and AP classes, but you want to think about you know. Is your passion going to carry you through those late nights where you have you know, two tests to study for the next day and things like that? And that's what I, I emphasize to the students. No, I, I, think, I think that's something. We, we're going to have to take a break, but I think that's something we should talk when we, when we come back. So, you know, maybe about that. Uh, what, what, what's the role of the parents? What's the role of the student? Mm -hmm. You know, and we mentioned earlier about the new policy for access and mm -hmm. equity, how mm -hmm. that integrates with this. Um, and if we have time, maybe we can talk a little bit about coding. I have this... <laughs> I, I don't know. It's it's almost like a, a predisposition to be biased against computers. So perhaps <laughs> we can talk about that. So, so anyway, if if you'll stay with us, we'll be back in about a minute, and we'll continue our conversation. Dad, we need to talk. If you're not going to listen to me, who will you listen to? Jeffrey. Is that Marcia Gay Harden? I think so. You're getting older. Not that old. Your brain is changing. That's what I was saying. Honey, I've got experience with this. Jeffrey, brain health is all about making the most of your brain as you age. Really? Go. Oh, where did she go? Learn what you can do to help keep your brain healthy at brainhealth.gov. Hi, and welcome back to Education Roundtable. Uh, this is Larry Petricaro, and I have with me uh, Jamil Misbahadeen. Mm -hmm. Um, Kim Bean and Ann Bodner, and we've been talking about STEM education as it relates to the uh, middle and the, well actually elementary, middle and, mm -hmm. and high school and, and uh, the enthusiasm kids have for it and how we can work on that. And one of the last things we talked about, uh, among others, was the 
um, the fact that these classes are open to all, that, that the, and this I think is an outgrowth of the new access and equity policy that we have. Uh, at one time I guess there was, there might have even been tests to get to different levels. So l let's talk about that. I think it's, it certainly has to be wonderful for kids to be able to pursue their passions, but likewise I suppose there's some preparedness or responsibility on their part and maybe things their parents should be aware, about, aware of if uh, and, and you know that we, they certainly you were talking before and during the break about the the whole academic experience it's it's not just focusing on on one thing and driving kids crazy or parents crazy over that so <laughs> so if you can remember what I just said <laughs> maybe, maybe we can talk about that how, how the access and equity policy is integrated into what sure. we're doing sure um, so the access and equity policy is is really driven by um, our goal to make all of our classes reflective of the demographic demographics of the of the entire school system, and so for that reason, you know, students can choose any level for any course that they're eligible for. And then, you know, another thing that we did also is we removed some of the levels that we had in our courses, so there's not such disparate, you know, differences between one course. It shouldn't look four different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and what that's then, you know, and in response is within the high school, one of the things that we did is we kind of looked, took a second look at our curriculum and our, our courses and said, you know, how can we design these courses so that any student can be successful? And a lot of times what you'll see is that the topics and the, pace, and the pacing in our courses, whether it's an academic or an honors level class, are the same. The difference is really just so more so supports for some students that may be, you know, needing that in an academic level. Um, and that's how we've responded and, and hopefully continue to kind of push the ball forward. Uh, towards that goal, yeah, you said the, the support is different. Mm -hmm. So, what, sure. what, 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 what so like a, a good that? example might be um, a physics class. You can take every sophomore takes physics. You can take it at, at the academic or the honors level, and oftentimes um, we'll give similar tests. We give actually the same tests uh, for our common assessments, our, our quarterly assessments. And so, an honor student and an academic student will take the same test, but. And in an honors class, there may, you may not be able to have a formula sheet, or maybe there's no curve on the test. But the, the teaching that's happening in the class and the instruction and the assessment is the same. Just a little bit less so supports at the honors level because we're raising the rigor there. Um, but the academic students are still being exposed to everything. We just kind of give them a, a little bit of a boost if we feel like maybe a topic for them might be challenging. We'll allow you to use the formula on the mm -hmm. test. Now, what about uh, making sure that you know, kids don't wind up... Uh, you know, with a nervous breakdown or something, mm -hmm. and, and so what, what kind of responsibilities do the kids have? What responsibilities do we as a district have to make sure we're not doing something that, that's going to have, you know, psychological... You know, I, I, think, I think what we need to do as a district and as, as adults and as our students begin to advocate for themselves mm -hmm. is to really start looking at school and the child as a whole child. And it's not just about the academic pieces that have to do with a daily life of a child or a student. Um, you know, we can have students who are extremely bright taking AP classes, uh, quite a few of them, and, and doing fine, but then um, they might also have an, a sport they play every season, or they might be the president of a club, or they might have a job, or they might, all those other things that take away from, um, take away time after school for doing homework or whatever, or studying for a test. And you know, I, one of the things that I think, um, when I went to Columbia High School in the 90s, um, early 80s, or late 80s, <laughs> early 90s, um, but one of the things that I noticed about being at Columbia is that I, I had an experience that some people when I went to college didn't have. And there were so many opportunities to have those, um, to find your passion. And, you know, some people, it's definitely academic and they want to, you know, they're focusing in and it's STEM and it's research, you know, finding the research piece of it. Um, for me, it was more, I love sports. I played sports. I was, um, you know, I was doing those things. I also had a job. Um, so the thought of you have to out, you have to really weigh all the different things that are happening when you t when you make your selections, um, your course selections. Think about the fact that you know sometimes if you have three AP classes, you're going to be up late at night, and is that healthy for your child to be doing every single night until midnight studying? And I and I, you know coming from me who truly believes in educating the whole child, I don't know if that's right for everyone. Um, so, you know, my, one of the things that I really um, will constantly say to parents if I ask them, if they ask me for any advice, is, is to look at 
your child completely. Look at their, their um, developmental and maturity level. Look at um, their ability to organize themselves and to, you know, there'll be a lot of projects and different things where they have to break it out and, you know, meet different deadlines. Look at their schedule outside of the, the eight o'clock to three o'clock time. Are they playing sports? Are they, some kids are doing private sports lessons. Some kids are doing music. I mean, the musical too is every single day <laughs> till very late at night. So there's all these things that our kids should be um, part of and enriching their lives um, that you don't just focus on that academic piece. Make sure that they have a passion and a love somewhere outside of that academic piece. So, so we're, you were, um, one of the things I interpret from that is that there's a parental responsibility not to look at their uh, child as just a student who has to achieve academically but as a person who, who, yeah. who has to you know, achieve in a more holistic sense. But I also, I think the other piece of this too, and that the three of us I know, and, and everybody at, at our administration level, um, that we're trying to do is I would love to see our students who like are trying to figure out if they want to take that the, the honors class rather mm -hmm. than an academic level to take that honors class and know that there are supports that can help. So if you find you're in an academic level, there are supports within Columbia High School and even in the middle school that you can use to be able to to help your, you uh, along. So for instance, um, period nine at the, at the high school is an opportunity for most students to have, do not have a period nine. If they're finding they're struggling in something where they took that risk that I'm gonna go for it and I'm gonna take this honors class or this AP class, but I'm struggling a bit, they can go to their teacher at that time and they can get extra support. There's also um, the SLAM lab at um, in the library and it's pretty much open all day and, Correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but kids can drop in at free periods or lunch and, and they can get support from teachers there also. Um, and we continuously are sitting down and brainstorming ideas on how we can support students because we do want them to excel, but we want them to excel in a way that is um, supportive mm -hmm. from and, and, and hopefully giving them um, any types of supports that they need to be successful. We don't want them to be out there feeling desperate because they don't know what to do because they're, they're, they're struggling. And that's when we start looking at quality of life for our children are not, is not up to par. When you give the supports and you know that, and they know where to go when they're struggling, that's when they can overcome that, um, that point in time in, in, of, of taking a risk, right? Actually, that, that's an interesting way, a good, nice way to put it, I think, to take the risk. So are there any markers parents might look for, you know, because I think sometimes as parents we may get overly obsessed with the mm -hmm. academic performance, mm -hmm. academic mm -hmm. achievement. Are there things that maybe uh, parents ought to, or, or, ought to consider that, uh, you know, maybe I'd better rethink this, or, or not me, but maybe, maybe we should have a more of a conversation with the, with the children. Is there anything specific? I, I like? think Kim kind of started to bring that up in the, in the first part of this, um, talking about readiness and understanding yeah. your child and understanding um, what they love and what they have passion for, but also their, their work habits. Um, you know, you, if you want to take AP classes, you have to really love what you're learning, and, and that's really the rea reality of it. And even the research classes that um, Jamil talked about, you want to see that passion in your students. We, sometimes we tend to push our students and our children into things that they're not ready for. They don't have that passion, and if you don't have that, it's hard to it's hard to love it and hard to do all of those things. It's hard to do things that you don't really like. No, I, uh, I agree. So, we ought to um, we, we ought to recognize, I guess, then that what we're trying to, if I'm interpreting this right, if I'm not telling me that what we're trying to do is educate the whole student. We're mm -hmm. not trying to we're not try, we're not trying to develop specialists, so mm -hmm. to speak. I guess is is maybe one way to look at right. it. And, yeah. and I, I'm sorry, yeah. I, but I do think as as you go up in your in, or change different um, make different choices in your courses, it, you you become more of an independent learner. So if you are an independent learner and you have that drive, and correct me wrong if I'm wrong too, but that, then that's what an AP class is like. You're really doing a lot of this learning on your own, even at the honors level, um, that you might be getting a question or a problem and you have to go work on it and, and grapple with it and really think about it. So there's not someone necessarily telling you, you could do this first and then you do that and then you do that, and that's how you solve the problem. Mm -hmm.
I think another piece too is thinking about, and this is often a conversation I have with the student if they're asking me, what you know, if they should take the AB course or not, and they kind of talk to me about their whole schedule. I ask, you know, what are your plans after Columbia High School? Because, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes students will come and they want to take, they want to take, you know, as many courses that have the letters AP next to them. But then we talk about, well, what do you want to use this for afterwards? And mm -hmm. And then we can go through it. And if a student says, oh, I want to be a nurse, okay, let's look up what tool do you want to go to. And we'll look up their program and what they require. And, and it kind of helps us kind of backwards plan. All right, well, if you want to be ready for this course, what do we have here at Columbia High School that's a good fit for you? Okay. Um, so that's a good conversation that we often have as well. Yeah, no, it's, it sounds like a necessary conversation, too. And I like the term you use, the readiness and the willingness to, uh, to be an independent learner. Um, that's a certain one word that's become sort of popular is that word grit. I guess in a yeah. sense, maybe yeah. that's what you're talking yeah. about. Because one of the things you mentioned, Kim, was that um, that at the elementary level, kids love science, mm -hmm. and then they move into the middle school and they still kind of like science. So uh, that is that passion at that, if you want to call it that, at that elementary level, just a result of kids being inquisitive about everything and not having. At some point, they separate themselves out. I, I used to notice this in, in uh, you know, when younger kids would play sports. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, the really young kids could recognize uh, effort, but they didn't necessarily recognize achievement. And, and you know, and I, I, I mean, I kind of coach it. Sort of has something to do with it because the kids begin to weed themselves out. And I don't know if you see that happen in, in, in the uh, transition from elementary up through high school, that they begin to have different opinions of themselves. I think that's a big piece in the middle school. Their sense of self is, is somewhat fragile in the sense that they're just deciding who their self is for the first time. Um, and there are kids who want to take on every experience and want to take on every challenge, usually because they've been successful in other things in their lives, and so they think, well, why not? Um, <laughs> but, and, but there are students who are just more cautious by nature, mm -hmm. and they think, no, I'd rather be, I'd rather, you know, take a slower pace and be more successful at it. And part of our job, certainly, is to encourage those students who, like, if, we think you can do it. Yeah. So, you know, push yourself a little bit, challenge yourself. And mm -hmm. as a, I'm a parent of a, an eighth grader who, just picked his courses for ninth grade and I think there are so many things at Columbia High School that sound so exciting mm -hmm. to the kids I and mean, he came home and he's like I did my whole schedule I just don't have time for lunch <laughs> and I was like what yeah. you know so because he wanted to take French and he wanted to take Italian and he wanted to do all the you know all the other things that are possible there so I think it's all very exciting and I think parents can help sort through some of that and that idea of what Jamil was saying about working back from what your goal is that can be hard in some senses when someone's 14 they don't know what they're doing after school let alone mm -hmm. after yeah. you know 12th grade so I think all of that gets taken into consideration of, of how you can support your child or how much they can take on at any one time. And I feel like f for me as a parent, I've just tried to increase it gradually, the responsibility that he has and, and not let him get to a point where the floor is out just like, well, let's try, we'll add that on, we'll add that on, we'll add that on and, and see. And I think also the good, and maybe Kim, you can talk to this a little bit, is about when you make a decision in um, sixth grade, you don't, you're not stuck there through high school, right? You know, we, I'm afraid we're out of yeah, time, yeah. but you, you've just listed a number of other things that I would have liked to talk to you about. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll be back. <laughs> May have to be. But thank you for joining us on Education Roundtable.